Good afternoon, good evening for everybody. And thank you, Bryony, for this uh, introduction. And it's a great pleasure and honor to give this talk, the Gideon Delon lecture for this year. So I would like to talk about giants, but have you ever heard of a giant? And I guess all of you know very well about Goliath from the Bible. And according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, he was about four cubits and a span, which is about two meters tall. And of course, another giant, again, probably all of you have seen in the movies, this, this is a, a real patient who, of course, worked as an actor. So today, I would like to introduce you to the pituitary gland, the master gland. I will mention some old cases of gigantism. I will spend quite a bit of time on the oldest case, on the genetic origin of uh, gigantism, a bit on the differential diagnosis, and I will tell you about the Irish giants and also giants in mythology and art. So let's start with the pituitary gland, which is really the center of the cause of gigantism in, in the cases I will talk about. And this is a little organ right in the middle of our head. And you can see on the left on a drawing and on the right, the uh, organ or as seen on an MRI, MRI scan. And if this is the bottom of the skull, the pituitary gl gland sits right in the middle. And this bit here is the pituitary stalk, which connects the pituitary gland with the rest of the brain, which is sitting above it. And this is a real life picture from the pituitary gland. Here you see the front part of the gland. This is the back part of the gland. And this is the stalk, as you see from above. And this is how you see it from below. So what is the function of the pituitary gland? This is again, the front part and the back part of the gland. And the front part makes a couple of hormones and we'll talk quite a bit about growth hormone today, but it also makes a hormone which regulates the thyroid gland. It makes two hormones which regulate the gonads, the testes and the ovary, and this will be relevant for gigantism. So I will mention that later. Also a bit of prolactin, uh, which is important for breast milk and another hormone which regulates uh, the hormones coming out from the cortex of the adrenal gland, uh, which is important for survival, uh, the hormone called cortisol. So growth hormone is a, is, is, is a bit similar to many of the other hormones, and that is the hormones are part of endocrinology, so the art of endocrinology, and this is a little bit of kind of Goldilocks science, that it needs to be just right. It cannot be too much. That gives you a problem. It cannot be too little. So that's true also for growth hormone. So if you have too little growth hormone in childhood, for example, you will have short stature. If you have too much growth hormone, um, usually due to a benign tumor of the pituitary gland, and if this happens in childhood, you will suffer from gigantism. And here you can see one of the patients from Bart's hospital uh, with uh, one of our nurses uh, photographed in the, in the hospital where are really tall doors. And you can see one of these old doors. Uh, he was really tall. If you get too much growth hormone as an adult, you develop a disease, what we call acromegaly. This is from the Greek word, meaning that enlargement of the end of the body, but it's not just the end of the body, quite a lot of internal organs are also uh, enlarged. So here you see typical facial features with the patients with acromegaly, enlarged tongue. You can see what happens to the hand um, in, in patients with acromegaly. So coming back to the anatomy again, this is the gland here. Uh, um, and I show you here together with an MRI scan now in a frontal view. And what I would like to point out that just above the gland, this yellow object here is the optic nerve, the nerve which helps us to see. And this here is what we call the optic crossing. And that's actually important because if there is a tumor growing in the gland that sooner or later might reach this uh, optic crossing and will interfere with our vision. So here you can see a little bit enlarged gland with a tumor about one and a half centimeter. And here is a larger one. So just to point out again, this is the normal pituitary gland. And here you see a bigger tumor or a somewhat smaller tumor. So the vision is important because if the tumor is growing right underneath this optic crossing, then it will damage the nerve uh, fibers, which uh, allow you to see the side of your vision. So this part here and this part of your visual field. So instead of seeing this, uh, 
uh, picture like this, you will see that you see the middle, but you don't see what's on the side. So coming back to Goliath, if he indeed had a pituitary tumor, which caused his gigantism, maybe the tumor caused him to have what we call tunnel vision, and that helped David to come from the side and kill him with his stone. Of course, this is just a theory. So the oldest known case of gigantism is from Egypt, about uh, 2700 uh, BC. And here you see the skull, which they think belonged to a person who was 187 centimeters, which obviously is very tall at the time. Here is another patient from Rome who was more than two meters. And you see uh, one of the, the bones uh, from the leg uh, showing the difference between a normal sized bone from the, the same uh, time. And here you see, uh, you, you can't really recognize that this is the base of the skull, but this is the area where the pituitary gland sits. And you see that uh, due to the tumor, this is flattened as opposed to that bony pocket, which I showed you earlier. Here is another giant from Norfolk from the sixth century, uh, two meter, 23 centimeters. And yet another one from Yorkshire, again, from the sixth century. Uh, these are the only bits remain from this uh, um, giant. And yet another one, a, a female uh, giant from Poland was two meter 15 from the 12th century. So when we talk about gigantism, we really need a definition because we know there are some people who are taller, some people who are shorter. So um, what is the definition of gigantism? So we call somebody uh, suffering from disease if they have abnormal high growth velocity as a child and they have the hormones uh, showing a high uh, value. So the growth hormone, which we abbreviate GH, the growth hormone would be high and cannot be suppressed uh, with a sugar load, which we usually use as part of a diagnostic test. And then growth hormone stimulates another hormone called IGF-1. And the level of this one will be also high in patients uh, who have the disease. And then we can also look at uh, uh, height standards, so either three standard deviation above the mean height for that age, or you can take into account the parent's height or the height of the average people from that uh, genetic background from that country, and then you can have uh, uh, um, you know, these two different uh, uh, criteria. And gigantism otherwise is an extremely rare disease. So what do you need really to be a giant, a, a giant due to a pituitary disease? Well, first of all, you need a lot of growth hormone, but not just that, you also need to have the ability to make your bones longer. So the end part of the bone, which we call epiphysis is open. And this of course happens in a child who is still growing, but it also happens in a person who might not be might not be a child by age, but hasn't gone through puberty and therefore the bone hasn't closed. And during puberty, uh, we have the sex hormones. So the testosterone from the gonad or the estrogen from the, the uh, uh, ovary, and that uh, matures the bone and closes the bone. So you stop growing. So if you have a delayed puberty, either because the tumor in the pituitary gland destroys those cells I pointed out, which makes these two hormones which regulate the gonads, then you will lack puberty. And also one of the other hormones, prolactin, which sometimes is co-expressed from by the tumor with growth hormone. Uh, if you have high level of this hormone, again, that will inhibit puberty. So if we look at the wrist, this is usually the part of the body when we check somebody's bone age. And uh, these are the two bones in, the, in our lower arm, the ulna and the radius. And this is the real x-ray of an adult person. And this is an x-ray of a child. So if you look carefully, you see this is the end of the bone, what we call the epiphysis. And this is the child's one. And you see a gap here, right here and right here. But if you look carefully, you will see that also in the, in the and the hand, you can see these gaps here in the bone. These are the parts where this child's uh, bone is still growing. So between this bit of bone and this bit of bone, or between this bit of bone, this bit of bone, the cells are growing and making the bone longer. And let's look at now one of the famous 
giant's uh, uh, x-ray of the hand and this is from the museum so you see the nails which they put together the the skeleton and as you can see despite the uh, John Hunter who put together this uh, skeleton was an extremely uh, good anatomist he was also a surgeon he uh, had to use several nails in this part to actually fix this uh, a bone and the reason why he had to use these extra nails here, because this part of the bone and this part of the bone were actually separate and there was a line between the two. And that's because this patient, despite being 22, which is already an adult and it should have stopped growing, he was still growing, his bones were not fused. So you need this as well for an, over a long time to have high growth hormone levels to, to grow to be a giant. So what's the first description of gigantism? As, we, as far as we understand, uh, there was a Dutch physician in 1567 who described a female giant who was normal until early uh, teenage years and then started to grow very rapidly and also stopped uh, uh, the gonadal function. There were several other uh, descriptions, but I would like to mention Pierre Marie, who was a French neurologist at the end of the 19th century, because he gave an excellent clinical description of the disease acromegaly, and he also gave the name to the disease acromegaly. However, at the time, he did not realize that the disease is actually due to the pituitary gland. And he also didn't realize that acromegaly, the disease what we see in adults, and gigantism, what we see in children, um, is the same disease. He saw these are two different conditions. So there was actually quite a bit of debate in the medical literature at the time, because in, in acromegaly, all the organs are larger. So as I said, the hands and the feet, but also the liver, the bowels, the uh, uh, lots of internal organs are also bigger. They were not sure that the enlargement, what they see in the pituitary, pituitary gland is the consequence of acromegaly or is it the cause? And there were a couple of doctors who suggested that the pituitary enlargement is indeed the cause of the disease. And of course they were right about that. And then the other question is acromegaly and gigantism, same or different diseases? And some people said that acromegaly is an acquired disease in adulthood, while gigantism is a congenital disorder. While some other doctors suggested that this is the same disorder and really it's just a different of the age of onset. If it starts in childhood, you, it's gigantism, and if it starts in adulthood, it's acromegaly. Well, we will see that actually both set of these doctors were right in one way or another. So if gigantism is really a congenital disorder, uh, therefore a genetic disorder, uh, it, we should see that in identical twins. And indeed, in these pair of Japanese uh, identical twins, we can see that both of them have uh, uh, gigantism. Here on this picture, we saw the patient whose x-ray I showed you earlier, Charles Byrne, and he, we can see him together with two of his cousins who were actually twins. So I told you gigantism is extremely rare disease and having a picture of the three of them, twins with the same disease and their cousin who is even taller than the twins, uh, suggest that this must be a genetic disease. And this picture is in the National Portrait Gallery since the end of the 18th century. Uh, if this is a genetic disease, we should see that in uh, siblings as well. And of course, here is a pair of siblings, seven siblings, two of them suffering from gigantism. And here's a, a modern day equivalent of those. These, this girl was 10 years old when she was diagnosed uh, with gigantism, but unfortunately, the brother wasn't brought to the attention to the doctors until he grew over two meters. This is a patient from the United States who was extremely tall, over two and a half meters. And he had history in his grandfather also being a giant, again, suggesting uh, that this could be a genetic disease. And this is just a photograph of his hand with a drawing showing the size of his hand compared to a, a healthy hand. The famous uh, American neurosurgeon, Harvey Cushing, also describes in his book, uh, the pituitary body and its disorders, which is one of, one of the most 
uh, fundamental important books in the history of uh, pituitary diseases. And he describes his case 31 here, that this is a patient with uh, acromegalic aspect and Mendelian tendencies. And of course, uh, Mendelian tendencies means that it's a genetic disease because his uh, grandfather uh, was also a giant. And he mentioned that this patient would have interested Francois Rabelais, who is a French doctor who wrote a, a novel about a giant family. So if we think about the genetic causes of gigantism, uh, I would like to talk about the two main causes and one gene, which is called AIP, here is the long name, um, which is the most common genetic cause of gigantism. And most of our families, if not almost all the families described are due to this uh, particular gene uh, abnormality. And another uh, disease I will mention, what we call X-linked acrogigantism. And these are the ones who start at a very, very young age. And these are the tallest giant have this particular disease. So for us to understand the genetics, I would just like to take you back to the cell. And in the cell nucleus, uh, we have the DNA, uh, the chromosomes, uh, obviously made of DNA. And here are the pair of chromosomes. And I point out for you chromosome 11 here, and this is uh, on chromosome 11, where the AIP gene is located somewhere here next to plenty of other genes. And here is the X chromosome, which is the, uh, where the gene for the other disease, the X-linked uh, gigantism is located. So this is how the DNA looks like, and we have four uh, bases, which are represented by the, the steps of this ladder here. And, and these are giving us a code for our genetic makeup. So usually every three of these base pairs give us a code for an amino acid, and that is the building block of our proteins. And if we take one of these triplets, CGA, that codes for an amino acid called arginine. However, if there is a damage to this DNA, and one of these base pair changes. So for example, this C changes to one of the other um, building block T, then it becomes CGA, becomes TGA. And this TGA is a code for a stop codon. So the stop codon means that the protein can be built up till this point, but at that point, the protein is not synthesized any further. So if we look at this model of a protein here, which is the AIP protein, the protein usually starts to be um, built from this end, and then it's built all the way until this stop codon comes, which normally should only be at the very end of the molecule. But here is an early stop codon due to the mutation, what we can see here. So this part of the protein is missing, and this part is very important for the function of the protein. So this protein will not work properly. And this is actually the mutation, what we see in the Irish giant patients. So here I show you a typical family with an AIP mutation. Uh, the person with the blue arrow is this young man here at the age of 14. And here's the surgeon who actually operated on his pituitary gland at the time. And you can see that he has several other family members who have a pituitary tumor, either gross hormone secreting pituitary tumor or this cousin had actually a prolactin secreting uh, pituitary tumor. But what you can also uh, see that not all the patients who have the gene actually develop the disease. So the patients or the persons with the orange color, they all positive for the same mutation as the pa patients who have the disease, but they did not develop the disease. And this is one of the puzzles we're trying to solve now, why some people have the gene and they are perfectly healthy, while other people have the gene and they develop the disease. So briefly about the other cause of gigantism, this X-linked acrogigantism, which was only described uh, a few years ago. And, and this is due to a very unusual mutation. Here we have a duplication of a particular gene. This gene is called GPR101. And this is located on the X chromosome. So a normal female will have a copy on each of the X chromosome and a normal male will have just one copy. But if you have this disease, then on one of the X chromosomes, this gene is duplicated. So altogether, a female person would have three copies of this gene and a male person would have two copies. And here I show you a photograph of a, 
of siblings. This is a healthy six-year-old girl. And the little sister, you see exactly the same height, which is unheard of between a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And you can see the completely changed body proportions that a wider shoulder, bigger, um, the whole body is just uh, enlarged uh, due to the disease what she has. Uh, the tallest ever giant we, we know of is Robert Wadlow from the United States from the middle of the 20th century. And although we don't have his DNA based on the history of his disease, we think that he very, very, very likely had this X-linked acrogigantism. And this is another patient, a female patient. Again, we don't have her DNA, but it it is very likely that she had the same disease. Here you can see this patient at the age of 10 years, she was already 190 centimeters. These are together with her classmates and this is a teacher, she's the same height as the teacher. And she ended up being 227 centimeters, but as you can see, she needs a wheelchair to move around. It's really a cruel disease to have, to have gigantism. <clears throat> And the current uh, tallest man on earth, he also uh, has uh, excellent acrogigantism and his DNA we do have, and we've proved that he indeed, that is the cause of his disease. But not all giants are actually due to a, a pituitary tumor and, and too much growth hormone and, and IGF-1. There are some other diseases also give you, can give you very tall stature. One of the uh, diseases you might have heard of called Marfan syndrome. And this uh, young sportsman actually have Marfan syndrome. He had, when the, he was diagnosed, he had to stop playing professional basketball because it could be actually dangerous of several points of view for him. And another disease which, which is, uh, is even more rare is, uh, is uh, this little girl has that. So she was four and a half when she was referred to pediatric endocrinology and she had her height five standard deviation away from the normal. So the normal is this orange line here this thicker orange line. And then this is her height plotted on this graph. You can see that she's extremely tall. And the clue to the diagnosis was a very simple test. You just had to examine her. And on her feet, you can see this extremely tall um, halluses, and that gives a clue to the diagnosis. Here is another patient who also has uh, a similarly kind of long toe, an extremely long tall stature. He actually was already born as a baby with a is, is a very big baby, two teeth already at birth, a twisted spine at birth, and he grew to be two meters 34 with a huge, um, long, needed very long shoes. And you might have seen him in various films uh, such as here. So the disease, what this patient had is a disease of a pathway called the natriuretic peptide C pathway. So that's a pathway which is important for cartilage de development. And the cartilage growth is extremely rapid. And that's why these patients have the tall stature um, and they have normal pituitary function, normal growth hormone or IGF-1. This is a milder case, again, still from this pathway, you see this man doesn't have uh, so bad disease as the actor on the previous slide, uh, but he, he has this. And what's also interesting that Dutch people who are typically very tall, one of the explanation is that, that in, in that country, uh, there is a, a variant, what we call a DNA polymorphism, uh, which is affecting the, the, the ligand of this pathway or one of the receptor, which is important uh, of the pathway. And that gives the chance that people in Holland uh, are a little bit taller than the rest of the world. So when we're talking about giants, uh, of course, they are working uh, in, in various jobs if they are not too ill or not die at a very early age due to their disease. So here you see uh, Jacob Ali, who worked in a circus with large animals, or you see the actor, uh, uh, in the 007 films, or another one was a professional boxer, and he actually was one of the Irish giants. And we have his uh, grandson and great-grandson uh, uh, DNA. And of course, Shrek was based on a patient with acromegalic gigantism. Maurice Tillet lived in the first part of the 20th century. He was a poet and also a wrestler. He spoke 14 languages, but unfortunately died at a young age. There are quite a few cases where injustice uh, was done to giants. 
quite a few had their uh, bodies stolen after they died and exhibited. And the prime example, of course, is Child Burns in the Hunterian Museum. But there is also a case in Montpellier, a uh, medical school museum, or another one in Paris. Robert Wadlow, the tallest ever man, had intrusion into his life and an untrue description. And he actually uh, started a court case against the doctor who did these accusations and the American Medical Association where those accusations appeared in, in their journal. Uh, but at the time, unfortunately, we're talking about in the 30s, uh, he, he lost his court case. I hope it would have happened differently now. Well, we hope, hopefully it wouldn't have happened at all. And also there could be an autopsy without permission. And actually one of Cushing's, uh, Harvey Cushing uh, cases was that which was only published a few years ago, uh, that there was a, a, an autopsy which was conducted without the family's knowledge while uh, they were sitting at the funeral service. And it required secrecy and deceit on the part both the surgeons as well as the undertaker. And these are the tissues which were removed uh, during these circumstances and, and then uh, published in, in Harvey Cushing's book. The giants also suffer from psychological burden. I mentioned that quite a few of them has hypogonadism, which means that they don't go through proper through puberty properly. And that gives quite a lot of stress, you know, comparing themselves to their peers. Also, there is this description, the boy was so shy as to appear depressed and almost stupid. And this was said about uh, Robert Wadlow, while his school records were excellent, he certainly had a perfectly normal intellect. For another case, it says, but his size was an embarrassment and he became a truant. So clearly this, this extreme height is really, really damaging uh, both for female and male patients. And many of them wish to walk down the street without people staring at them, which unfortunately would not happen. Patients with gigantism usually died in their 20s, and there are many reasons for that. They probably had a growing tumor in their head. They probably were missing the hormones, which were damaged, the other hormones from the pituitary gland, and especially the one which regulates the adrenal gland called ACTH, uh, regulating cortisol, and the other one uh, regulating the thyroid gland. These are the two uh, important hormones uh, which, which might have... Uh, uh, missing uh, might have shortened their lives and also the the complications of the acrom or the high growth hormone uh, the acromegalic gigantism which gives them diabetes high blood pressure and and lots of other problems but with treatment the survival is significantly better so if i show you a couple of more modern day giants this is a giant patient from ukraine who uh, died at the age of 46. And the patient I showed you earlier from Bart's Hospital died just a few years ago at the age of 68. And uh, the actor who we've seen in the 007 uh, films, he died at the age of 76. So these are extremely good numbers compared to the historical survival of giants. So let me then talk to you about now the Irish giants. Of course, you might know the popular folklore. Legend has it that uh, Finn McCool, the Irish giant, built the giant causeway as stepping stones to Scotland so as not, not to get his feet uh, wet. And this is the giant causeway in Northern Ireland. And you can see the extremely similar uh, stone formations in this little island here, the Staffa Islands in Scotland. So this is where this famous bridge might have been. And the other story is that he also once scooped out part of Ireland to fling at his Scottish rival, but it missed and landed in the Irish Sea. So the clum became the Isle of Man and the void became Loch Ney. And this is Loch Ney, and we will return to this later. So Charles Byrne, who I mentioned now repeatedly, his skeleton is depicted in the Hunterian Museum in London. And this is the skeleton here. I showed you the X-ray of this hand earlier. 
And this is his skull. And here you see this cut. This cut was done by Harvey Cushing himself about 100 years after the giant died. He visited London. And this was exactly the time when people argued that gigantism is due to a pituitary tumor. So he wanted to look into the skull. And he could, when he opened the skull, he could see that there is an enlarged pituitary fossa, which is practically the proof that this giant had a pituitary tumor. So that was the cause of his disease. My story, well, the story where, where I kind of entered later started back in 1974, when this young man at the age of 19 walked into Bart's hospital due to a lot of symptoms of his uh, acromegalic gigantism. And uh, the professor, Michael Besser, who was my uh, mentor and teacher, uh, was, was a younger doctor at the time, and he started to treat him. And this patient has been the patient of our hospital ever since. He belongs to a family and he also has a distant cousin also with gigantism. And we found that he has a mutation, this mutation I mentioned earlier in the AIP gene. But what was also interesting that we found three other families and all of these patients he himself was from Northern Ireland and all these other families were from Northern Ireland. And this is when the idea came that we have here a couple of patients, a couple of families with gigantism from Northern Ireland. And then there is this skeleton in the museum, uh, which is called the Irish giant. And at the time I wasn't aware of the geography, but I learned it very quickly. So here, first of all, you can see the lake I mentioned earlier. And the patient who I showed you first uh, lived just very close to this lake. And then some of the other families who I showed on the previous picture, they also came from this area. And Charles Byrne was born in this village here, while the, the cousins, um, the twin cousins from the 18th century were born here. So this was the point when we asked the Hunterian Museum to uh, give us permission to remove uh, a tooth from the giant's uh, skull, which is a very good uh, source of DNA. And this is one of the uh, uh, tooths which was removed uh, at the time. And we managed to get good quality DNA uh, from, this, uh, from this tooth. And we found that uh, the mutation, what we identified in this patient is uh, exactly the same, what we found in the tooth which was removed here from the, from the giant skeleton. So this uh, showed that these two patients are distant cousins uh, of each other. But there are other giants as well. So this is a giant uh, in the anatomy department in Dublin, uh, Dublin Trinity College, Cornelius McGrath, and also on a beautiful painting here. Or another giant in the book of William Carlton, who wrote that uh, this there was a celebrated Irish giant, Big Mackie, a man, a colossus, who lived in this village called Clogger. And guess what? Clogger is right here. And then another one, uh, a poem about uh, Irish giant babies, and they were living in a village which was again just off our little map here. And then another giantess back from the 17th century, uh, who was born the Isle of Portrus, just not far away from the giant causeway in the northern part of Northern Ireland. And Hugh Murphy from the early 20th century, Patrick Murphy from Kilowan, which is just again very close to Loch Ney. And then another giant who is called James Kirkland, and he was famous because he actually went to Germany to join the Lange Kerls army of King Friedrich William. As you know, Friedrich William was also called the soldier king. He was only 160 centimeter, but he really liked tall soldiers. So he collected a whole army of soldiers. He called them Lange Kerl or tall fellows. And the minimum height requirement for his uh, soldiers were 188 centimeters. And he collected these uh, soldiers uh, from all over the place, uh, also got some of them as a gift. And sometimes the young men were actually kidnapped to join his army. He was so proud of them, he never went to, wanted them to go to war. And she had at some, he had at some point um, almost 4,000 of these tall soldiers from all over the world. Interestingly, the reenactment guard of tall fellows are still present in Potsdam and, and they do kind of shows uh, with, with their army. 
So coming back to the Irish giants, here is Patrick Cotter, who was a contemporary of Charles Byrne, and he knew what happened to, to Charles Byrne regarding his body being stolen and then exhibited. So he was um, asked that he's buried in three coffins and in a grave which dug 12 feet deep in solid rock underneath the floor of a Roman Catholic church in Bristol. And then people forgot that he was buried there, but it was found in 1906 when this church was rebuilt. And they asked the uh, professor of anatomy in, in University College Bristol to look at the skeleton. And here you can see this extremely uh, tall skeleton and, and the size of the skull. And uh, they wrote a paper about this, uh, this uh, finding. And again, uh, this, um, they, they put back the bones into the church, but it was forgotten again. And then was, people were surprised to find it again in 1974 at another refurbishment of the church. And what is interesting that it was again given to the anatomy professor at the time in Bristol. And we have a lot of pictures and x-rays from the bones from 74. And there is an explanation why this giant always seemed to lean on uh, with his right hand on a door, because this is his right leg. So compared to the left femur, you see that the head of the femur is completely missing. So he probably had awful pain to stand up. And that's why he always needed to lean on something is a uh, part of his, his suffering. And here, are, here is the hand of this giant compared to the hand of the giant uh, living today who was treated at the age of 19 uh, compared to a, a medical student hand, you know, a normal sized hand just for comparison. So in 19, uh, in 74, they buried back the bones again into the church, but it was found again in 1986. So this is third time this poor person's bones were disturbed. And at the time, um, Philip Mann, who was the architect at the time doing the refurbishment, decided that enough is enough, and he cremated the bones of this giant. And of course, when I found about the genes of uh, the Irish giants a couple of years later, I was quite interested to look at whether this uh, Patrick Cotter would have been uh, one of those Irish giants with the same mutation. But by the time the bones were cremated, so I couldn't, I couldn't do the study. So we were, we were very happy that we found these uh, four families, but uh, it made me to go further when this patient was referred to us in London. And this patient was a nine-year-old boy from Belfast who had poor concentration, deterioration, schoolwork, increasing stature and decreasing vision, so much so that he was completely blind on the right eye and also on the left, he had major problems. And you can see this enormous four centimeter tumor in the middle of the head, obviously the optic nerve wrapped around this tumor, no wonder that he couldn't see much. And that made me decide that the, of course he had the same Irish, Irish mutation I showed you earlier, that we really should find all the patients so we can avoid this happening, what happened to this little boy. And we did a population screening in two small towns, which was in the center of the area where most of the uh, cases were identified. And over two weekends, we collected um, over 900 DNA samples from the local people. And where we collected the DNA was the local Tesco stores, because we saw that this is the place where lots of people coming over the weekend. So we can ask uh, to, to donate some, some saliva to, to extract DNA. And here you can see our team of, of colleagues who are also some of the patients, as you can see, help us to attract uh, people to, to the research. And we didn't just collect uh, DNA samples, but very interestingly, uh, an, an older uh, lady came into to Tesco to do her weekly shopping. But when she realized what we are doing and why we are doing it, she, she said, let me go home. I come back in half an hour. And she came back with a huge uh, newspaper uh, from Toronto. And the newspaper from was from 1913 showing this photograph. And she said, look, this photograph is my mother's brother. And he suffered obviously from gigantism. And I unfortunately died very soon actually after this photograph was taken. And exactly the same story happened with another uh, 
person who wanted to do the Tesco shopping that weekend. And he brought his photograph to us. And this shows his grandfather's brother. And you can see the size of this person here. And then we asked him, OK, this is your grandfather's brother. But who is this person? Because this person, as you can see, has the typical features of acromegalic gigantism, both on his face and his hands. And also, you can see his height, although not as tall as him, but still very much taller than everybody else. He, he didn't even know who that person was on the photograph. So clearly, these giants are around that area. So we uh, completed our study with samples from uh, Belfast and Dublin endocrine departments, and then other Irish patients from our collection, and then some population samples, both from uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic Island Island, of course, and the local population screening. And at the time, this was now a few years ago, we found 18 families, 18 pedigrees, and uh, quite a lot of patients and carriers who, who are unaffected by carrying the gene uh, by this gene. And this, this is just a map to show you some of these families where they live today. And when we did the analysis of the DNA samples from these 18, one person from these 18 different families, we found that all of them have exactly the same mutation, which is this little red colored bar here. But we also looked at their DNA sequence around the the mutation itself. And this purple area suggests that all these patients have smaller or larger piece of their DNA exactly the same, similar to each other, which suggests that these people are all sort of cousins of each other. Uh, right back to, to the oldest sample we had, which was Charles Byrne from the museum. So the question is that how long ago did that founder person lived who, who had first this mutation and then his descendants actually uh, created all these patients with, with gigantism. And we use the theory called the coalescence theory. So if you have four patients today, then if you go back in time and generations, you will find the one person who actually started this disease and used some clever calculations, we figured out that we, uh, how, long, how old is this mutation? So here I show you a family tree of these 18 current families who don't know each other, but we proved that they are all related to each other. And this is a possible tree which we set up, uh, how they could be related to each other back to the founder person who is here. And then with computers, we did 10,000 similar simulations, so 10,000 similar family trees, just to see which could be the possible, possible ones. And then using this method, we found that uh, the founder probably lived around 102 generations ago, which is equivalent to about two and a half thousand years. And what is interesting that back in the early 19th century, uh, this um, Dr. Pritchard, who wrote a book about the history of mankind, he already noted at the time that in Ireland, men of uncommon stature are often seen, and even a gigantic form and stature occur there much more frequently than in this island, which means Great Britain. Yet all the British Isles derive their stock of inhabitants from the same sources. So we can hardly avoid the conclusion that there must be some peculiarity in Ireland which gives rise to these phenomena. And I think that this peculiarity is actually the uh, mutation affecting the 304th amino acid in the AIP gene. And that probably explains all these historical and currently living giants. So if we go back to um, the... Um, mythology, we see that Goliath uh, uh, was, Goliath was a, was a giant, but there is another giant called Orion. And Orion had to have a helper uh, standing on his shoulders to tell him which way to go. And that's because he was blind. So now we understand why blindness and being a giant is related to each other. And here is another giant who was apparently um, uh, blinded by Odysseus and, and his, uh, his man, but still a, a giant associated with blindness. We also know other giants, uh, Hercules, Prometheus and Christopher. And also uh, we see uh, a lot of uh, paintings uh, in, in art. And for example, this painting from Peter Breiger probably shows a woman with the excellent acrogigantism syndrome, as you see, extremely tall woman. And even in Hindu uh, mythology, we can see giants, uh, for example, Taraka. 
And of course, the one I mentioned earlier, Rabelais um, wrote about a giant family, which we see that they, these families even uh, are around today. So in Scandinavian folklore, there is a folk tale about three Nordic giant brothers. And interestingly, the AIP gene, the very first time in 2006, was identified by a large Northern Finnish family who had this disease and many members with gigantism. There are some folklore about Solomon Island giants. And here is a picture from the Second World War when apparently the soldiers were afraid of these giants on Solomon Islands. And my colleague endocrinologist in Sydney identified a patient with gigantism from Solomon Islands with an AIP mutation. And our example, the Irish giants folklore and Finn McCool, and we identified AIP mutations in Irish patients with gigantism uh, present in this area for more than 100 generations. So I would like to finish my talk um, mentioning Jonathan Swift, who was a, a writer from Dublin, but he was invited to spend his summer in 1720 in a beautiful house called Laurie Manor. And the location of this manor is right here on our little map. And that summer, he wrote a book and clearly he got his uh, um, fantasy moved by the locals because the title of the book he wrote in this house here was Gulliver Travels. So in summary, gigantism, which is a pretty awful disease, can be treated if diagnosed in time. We now know that about 50% of the patients with pituitary gigantism have an identifiable genetic disorder. And our motto is that there shouldn't be any more giants in the 21st century because this is a disease we can treat, we can treat it in childhood and we can avoid these patients to be to grow too tall. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you the patients who helped us to do these studies, uh, my uh, colleagues and mentors who trained me and most of all, the trainees who worked with me on the various studies uh, which I presented today. So I'm grateful for all the patients and their families, the collaborating doctors and the funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Bryony. Thank you everybody for um, joining us. Uh, and my thanks to the Faculty of the History and Philosophy of uh, uh, medicine and pharmacy and the Society of Apothecaries and the President for inviting me to present the Gideon Delorn Lecture. Also, I will be speaking about Native American history, particularly the Comanches, so my gratitude to SIA, the Mother Church and History Keepers of the Comanche Nation, for their permission to relate the story of their people, Uda. I'd like to tell two parallel stories which uh, unfolded at the same time, the late 19th century, and in the same country, the USA, but in two very different worlds. In what we now recall as the Wild West, the Native American population was being held in forced captivity and the reservations allocated to them after the Indian Wars. At the same time, in the cities of the East Coast and the Great Lakes, the electric age was in full swing, and with it, the beginning of the era of modern industrial pharmacy. The story that links these two worlds is that of peyote, a small, insignificant looking cactus containing a powerful alkaloid compound, mescaline, the first example known to science of what we now call a psychedelic. During the 1880s and 1890s, the Plains Indian tribes adopted peyote as a medicine and as the central sacrament in the new religion that emerged from their struggle for survival as a people. At the same time, it came to the attention of Western medical science and was developed into a pharmaceutical product. In the first case, it thrived, spread and remains deeply rooted in Native American healing practices to this day. In the second, it failed to find a market and disappeared from the pharmacopoeia. I want to ask what these parallel stories tell us about the differences between indigenous and Western concepts of medicine 
And as 20th century, 21st century clinical practice turns its attention and hopes to psychedelic therapies, whether and how they might be successfully integrated into it. The trade in the peyote cactus is ancient, established in pre-Hispanic times across its natural habitat, the mountains and high desert of northern Mexico, extending across the Rio Grande into pockets of modern day Texas. Fresh buttons, as the heads are called, are heavy and bruise and spoil easily, but once dried simply by stringing them up in the desert sun, they're light and easy to transport and retain their potency for years, even decades. By the mid 19th century, a trading network was well established on both sides of the Rio Grande, and after 1845, when the northern side became part of Texas and the USA, Harvesting intensified in the parched plains and hillsides around the city of Laredo that are still referred to as the Peyote Gardens. The Texas Peyote Gardens drew visitors from many tribal groups across the southwest USA and became a center for exchange with the traditional cultures of Mexico. Peyote rarely changed hands for money. It provided the impetus for a barter economy in which a constellation of goods, artifacts, ideas and practices circulated. By the 1870s, the trade was partially monetized by local Hispanic traders known as peyoteros, who typically sold to visitors from more distant tribes without local connections. After the Texas-Mexico Railroad opened in 1881, Trains stopping at the local stations were regularly filled with barrels of dried peyote for transport to Laredo and on as far as Oklahoma. In 1887, a Texan doc doctor and crusading medical journalist named John Raleigh Briggs published an article in the Medical Register on muscal buttons, as he called them, a Mexican fruit with possible medicinal virtues. He had heard that Indians were in the habit of eating six or ten of these buttons, after which they lapsed into unconsciousness and remained thus for two or three days. On awakening, they related many remarkable adventures in the spirit world and the return to the prairies of innumerable herds of buffalo and wild horses. Briggs pr procured some buttons from a Mexican peyotero and ate a third of one, which he assumed would be a tiny dose but the effects were violent and rapid. His heart raced and breathing became difficult. Convinced he was about to die, he rushed to a doctor friend who revived him with ammonia and whiskey. The plant was, he concluded, well worth the trouble to investigate. In its potent physiological and psychoactive effects, I know of nothing like it except opium and cocaine. Briggs's article was reprinted in the Druggist's Bulletin the following month and drew an immediate inquiry from George S. Davis, the flamboyant and energetic general manager of the Detroit pharmacists Park Davis and Company, who sent a memo asking his staff to contact Briggs and ask when a supply of this fruit can be obtained. The reference to cocaine was particularly tantalizing. Pharmacies were now well stocked with sedative drugs such as bromides, chloral hydrate and morphine, but cocaine was, apart from caffeine and alcohol, the only central stimulant on the market. It was Park Davis's current blockbuster. By 1886, they were the leading US supplier, marketing it enthusiastically in powders, solutions and lozenges as the most important therapeutic discovery of the age. Concerns about its addictive properties were, however, starting to tarnish its image, and Davis was seeking alternatives. Ever since its foundation in 1866, Davis had built the company through drug discovery and entrepreneurship. By 1874, their catalogue listed over 250 types of fluid extract, 300 different pills and dozens of solid extracts and elixirs. In 1876, they patented the laxative cascara, derived from a plant long used by the native people of the Pacific Northwest. Now they were dispatching researchers to Mexico, Fiji and South America in search of further miraculous vegetable drugs. They developed their discoveries for market by supplying prominent physicians with regular working bulletins, pamphlets on new plants and drugs accompanied by samples and requests for feedback. 
Peyote was also brought to Park Davis's attention at this time by a Laredo dealer in ornamental cacti, Anna Nichols, whose nurseries boasted thousands of cactus specimens ready for shipment to the emerging domestic market. Nichols was one of the first commercial mail order cactus suppliers, offering almost any cactus found in Mexico to a clientele that became international after her display won a highest award at the Chicago's World Fair of 1893. One of her Mexican traveling companions she discovered in 1887 had sold 30,000 dried buttons of a cactus known as mezcal to a local trader, which were, as she wrote to Park Davis, being used by the Indians as a drink. She began supplying fresh specimens at five cents each to local Mexican customers who they told her used them to treat headaches. They pound and soak them in water, then strain and drink the water. They use the pulp left to bind any sort of sores. Park Davis found it difficult to square these wildly differing accounts. According to Briggs's report of Indian use, mescal was a vision producing narcotic that induced a two day coma. According to his alarming self experiment, it was a violent poison that accelerated the heart rate to a terrifying degree. Anna Nichols' evidence, however, suggested a mild tonic and poultice. Its botanical taxonomy was equally unclear. According to some testimonies, it was a dried mushroom, a confusion that would persist into the 20th century. The terms mescal and peyote were used interchangeably by some and differentiated by others. It was unclear whether they referred to one particular cactus species or several and whether these had different chemical properties. Mescal or muscal was a particularly unhelpful term since it was applied to three different plants, the peyote cactus, the strong spirit distilled from the agave plant, and the mescal bean, a bright red toxic seed used by various peoples of Mexico and the American Southwest as a medicine and a stimulus for vision quests. As a result, mescal was effectively a portmanteau term for local plant intoxicants blurring the alcoholic, the toxic, and the visionary. Park Davis forwarded some of the buttons supplied by Briggs to Harvard University, where Professor Sereno Watson, curator of Harvard's Grey Herbarium, identified it conclusively as a cactus and tentatively as a member of the genus Anhelonium, of which five species were known in Mexico, though he suspected this might be a new one. They also sent some of Briggs' sample to the world's leading specialist in intoxicating drugs, Dr. Louis Levin at the University of Berlin. A charismatic figure who held lecture theatres spellbound with his magisterial weave of chemistry, mythology, botany, history and medicine. He had published studies of hundreds of drugs from opium to arrow poisons, cyanide to cannabis, antiseptics to poison gases and the drugs mentioned in Homer. The peyote samples arrived just as Levin was on the point of visiting the United States to study the opium scene in San Francisco's Chinatown. And he stopped in Detroit to visit Park Davis's grand factory. He marveled at the new age of pharmacy that was opening up in America. I had not expected to see such a magnitude and such a skilled exactitude of workmanship, he wrote back to Berlin. The manufacture of pharmaceutical preparations is worthy of the American genius. At the ever expanding manufacturing plant on the Detroit River, plant materials were extracted and pills were rolled. All preparations were subjected to chemical assay, making them the first plant drugs in medical history with a standardized dose. Products were methodically tested on animals and batch numbers on labels allowed every pill or droplet to be traced to its source. Levin was given further peyote samples and on his return to Germany extracted a mixture of alkaloids and resins from them. Somewhere within the mix must lurk a stimulant and vision producing drug, but the extract also contained powerful toxins. Frogs and pigeons given large doses passed from vomiting and twitching to muscular spasms and eventually death. His initial findings published in the April 1888 issue of the Therapeutic Gazette identified an active principle he named anhalonine. 
Levin also passed some dried buttons over to a colleague at the Botanical Society of Berlin, who announced that despite its close kinship with the previous described Anhelonium williamsii, this appeared to be a new species. He named it Anhelonium lewinii in Levin's honor. It was a famous discovery, the first known example of an intoxicating cactus. The Park Davis pharmacists, however, were not entirely convinced by the identification, which would be struck down in 1894 when Lewinii was judged to be identical with Williamsii. Levin was aware that more work was required to isolate the drug or drugs involved, but claimed priority with an announcement that I expressly reserve to myself further investigations in this area. In the meantime, Park Davis went to market with a fluid extract tincture of anhelonium, which they offered in their 1893 catalogue. It had, they claimed, a marked physiological action similar to strychnine and was recommended as a respiratory stimulant and cardiac tonic. At the same time, the other peyote story was unfolding. In February 1891, James Mooney of the Smithsonian Institution's Bureau of Ethnology was in residence at the Bureau of Indian Affairs Agency at Anadarko, southwest Oklahoma, where the affairs of several tribes, including the Wichita, the Caddo, and some of the Kiowa were managed. Mooney had, in the course of his recent researches into the ghost dance phenomenon, proved himself a uniquely trustworthy white interlocutor, and he was approached by a young Kiowa man who came to tell me in a guarded manner that his people intended to eat mescal that night at a camp about 10 miles up the Wachita River and would probably be willing to have me present. As dark fell, Mooney was met by two men, a Comanche and a Mexican who'd been brought up by the Kiowa as a child captive. On their walk up river, he was told he must remove his hat when he entered the teepee and not to look at anyone while they were eating the seni, as peyote was called in Kiowa. Eventually they arrived at a copse beside the river where a teepee had been erected. As the door flap was drawn open, he saw a group of about 30 men, a mix of Kiowa, Comanche and Apache, seated in a circle around a central fire enclosed within a horseshoe of banked earth on which had been placed a large peyote button. At 10 o'clock, a master of ceremonies, known as the road man, rolled a smoke of tobacco and a dried corn shuck and offered an opening prayer before passing 12 dried buttons to each participant. They ate them, plucking the downy tuft from the center before chewing carefully and swallowing. At this point, a small water-filled drum and rattle were unveiled and passed around the group. Each participant in turn sang in their own language, with full voices and at the same time beating the drum and shaking the rattle with all the strength of their arms. This continued until midnight when the roadman blew an eagle bone whistle and water was passed around. Participants were allowed to leave the teepee and stretch their legs or relieve themselves. Few, however, do this as it's considered a sign of weakness. The singing and drumming resumed promptly and at one point in the dark hours that followed, the door flap was suddenly listed, lifted and a man stepped in carrying in his arms an infant, a child sick almost to death. Mooney watched with profound emotion the pathetic earnestness of the father as he watched the priests praying over his child, which seemed in stupor and made no sound, after which he left as silently as he entered. The songs and prayers continued through to first light when a group of women from the camp entered with water, bread, dried meat, sweetened corn and coffee. The ceremony ended with the roadman requesting Mooney that I should go back and tell the whites that the Indians had a religion of their own which they loved. Mooney spent much of his subsequent career honouring this request which went to the heart of his lifelong commitment to preserving the essence of Indian culture in a modern world committed to its forced assimilation. He described his experience in these terms. One seems to be lifted out of the body and floating about in the air like a freed spirit. The fire takes on glorious shapes. The sacred mescal upon the crescent mound becomes alive and moves and talks and you talk to it and it answers. 
you look around on your companions and they seem far away and unreal and yet you know they're close by your side. At times the songs and the drumbeat fill the teepee like a burst of thunder. Then the sound comes up from the ground and out of the air and is all around you like spirit whisperings. In the course of further peyote meetings, Mooney, Mooney found out that the Kiowa had learned of the peyote religion from the Comanche, whom he believed to be among the earliest adopters of the teepee ceremony, although it seemed from the beginning to have been a pan-tribal affair. The Comanche sphere of control across the southern plains had been vast, extending at times well into Mexico and the cactus's natural habitat. But as with the horse of which they became undisputed masters, it seemed they'd received the knowledge of peyote via intermediaries, such as the Apache bands who had raided deep into peyote country before being forcibly settled in Oklahoma alongside the Comanche. The many Comanche, Apache and Kiowa tales of the origins of peyote all placed its discovery in the distant south. In November 1893, Mooney arrived at the military base of Fort Sill, the administrative centre of the Comanche Apache Kiowa Reservation. It was intended as a cradle of civilization for the people regarded by white society as the wildest and most savage of all the Plains tribes, the last to be brought to heel. But for a nomadic people such as the Comanche, who had never planted a seed or conceived of land being owned, there was little appeal in a lifetime of hard labour for vegetables that they barely considered food. They quickly became dependent on beef rations, but these were meagre to begin with and pilfering by government employees and contractors who provided them meant they were left languishing in near starvation. The Comanche leader, Quana Parker, this is uh, Quana here, second from the left, kneeling down, this photo by James Mooney. Quana Parker had made his name as an outlaw warrior in the days before forced captivity, improved remarkably adept at navigating this new world. He negotiated directly with the Texas ranchers who wanted to use the rich Comanche grasslands for pasture and watering and insisted on being paid directly by them rather than via the agency. By the time of Mooney's visit, this arrangement was bringing considerable income into the reservation and to Quana personally. He began to use his white surname, dress in western suits with his long hair braided back and made several visits by train to Washington where he eventually met President Roosevelt, who accepted a return invitation to visit him at his grand cattleman style house. Quana accepted the title Chief of the Comanches, a role that had never existed in their days of freedom but allowed them to speak through him with one voice. Quana was a prominent advocate for the peyote religion, which had become established in the reservation after the Texas Railway opened. It was said that he'd first encountered peyote in 1884, when he was cured by it of a serious stomach illness. He may also have learned its rights from one of his wives, who was a Lipan Apache. Some histories credit him as the originator of the Plains peyote ceremony, and he was certainly one of its most effective proselytizers, but the peyote rite was no one's invention. It was a creation of all and none. Setting the ceremony at night and within a teepee was a response to the new strictures of forced captivity that included prohibitions on openly singing and dancing. The sacramental use of peyote was an innovation, but many of the ceremonial elements that surrounded it were of great antiquity. The form of the teepee circle, the water drum and gourd rattle, the sacred space purified with sage and cedar incense, the beaded feather fan and the eager bone, eagle bone whistle were familiar to every Plains Indian. The federal government treated peyote from the beginning as a medical problem and an obstacle to Indian assimilation. In 1888, the trade was banned on the Fort Sill Reservation but it was available at nearby trading posts and the clandestine nature of the teepee ceremony made it impossible to police. They keep it hid out like the whites do whiskey in Kansas, the exasperated new agent Charles Adams wrote in 1891. Quana stood his ground, insisting to the agency and to the missionary council that it was both a sacred tradition and a valuable medicine. In this latter capacity, it was used both as a general panacea 
anaspecific for pneumonia, liver disease, diabetes, sores, and eye inflammations. For its adherents, mostly men of the younger generation, the peyote rite was a microcosm of the old ways within the trauma of captivity, a way of maintaining their cult cultural identity in the face of shattered tribal structures, the removal of their children to boarding schools, and the destitution and alcoholism to which so many were reduced. It spread rapidly from Oklahoma across the Midwest and Rocky Mountain states, despite being prohibited in many jurisdictions. In 1918, the threat of a federal ban on peyote prompted a pan-tribal association on the advice of James Mooney to incorporate themselves formally as a religion to claim freedom of worship under the US Constitution. They chose the name Native American Church and described peyote as their sacrament. By this time, peyote had yielded up its secrets to Western science. In 1897, the Leipzig chemist Arthur Hefter snatched the prize of discovery from Louis Levin, whose researches into anhalonine had made little progress. Hefter isolated the resins and alkaloids from the cactus and self-experimented with each in turn. The resins produced nausea but little psychoactive effect. With a dose of the alkaloids, he was rewarded with entoptic visions on his closed eyelids, violet and green spots that developed into patterns like oriental carpets and eventually resolved into dazzling and ever-shifting landscapes and architectural forms. Dosing himself with five separate alkaloids in turn, Hefter established that these visions, visions were produced by one in particular, which, taking his cue from the common term mescal, he named mescaline. In 1919, in the laboratories of Vienna University, the biochemist Ernst Spitz successfully synthesized mescaline sulfate, starting from an oil found in eucalyptus. He established that it was a phenethylamine related to ephedrine, for which he'd also developed a synthesis. In 1920, Merck Pharmaceuticals made mescaline available as a research chemical and it was used extensively in neuroscience and psychiatry to study hallucinations and the optical and neural mechanisms that underlay them. Peyote, meanwhile, remained in the Western pharmacopoeia, but never established a successful application. In 1936, a tincture named Peyotil RD, sold by mail order from Geneva as a remedy for nervous conditions, attracted the attention of the League of Nations Advisory Committee on Traffic in Opium and Other Dangerous Drugs, who, on the basis of its hallucinatory effects and its prohibition on Indian reservations in the US, recommended that it should be limited to medical prescription. One of the leading enthusiasts for peyote as a medicine was the French doctor Alexandre Rouillet, who during the 1920s grew the cactus in the hills above the Côte d'Azur and marketed his own patent extract, Pan Peyotl. He had studied its use in indigenous healing and asked why it was esteemed in its homeland as a panacea while it struggled to find an application in Western medicine. For the Indians of Mexico and equally those of the prairie, he noted, illness does not have a physical cause. Peyote in Native American cultures held a magical power over disease which was seen as a spiritual affliction. Its medical efficacy was just one aspect of its power to render unseen forces visible, just as it warned of approaching enemies or evil influences and revealed the whereabouts of lost objects, it could unmask the hidden causes of sickness. These clairvoyant powers of peyote, Rouillet observed, were dismissed by doctors as superstition. By the same token, it was unreasonable to expect indigenous healing to translate obligingly into Western medicine. In the context of Western modernity, peyote had no spiritual power, merely a series of possible medical applications for which it was obliged to compete with other well-established drugs. Its medical properties were not illusory, but they were limited. It was doubtful, Rouillet concluded, that it could replace opium or hashish as a euphoric or bromine chloral and barbiturates as a nervous sedative or digitalis as a cardiac medicine. 
He recommended his own pan payotl in doses of 0.4 grams as a caffeine-like stimulant remedy for fatigue, migraine, and depression. The Native American church during this period expanded across the USA and beyond. In 1955, its umbrella association was renamed the Native American Church of North America to include the many chapters that had sprung up among the First Nations of Canada. There were and remain many variations among the different tribes and traditions, but the core ritual is recognizably the same as the one attended by James Mooney in 1891. It's a group ceremony in which, as witnessed by Mooney, individual healing rites are commonly included. The ceremony is regarded as especially potent against white man's diseases or diseases of modernity, which include mental distress, substance abuse and alcoholism. The role of peyote in indigenous healing has been described by medical anthropologists in terms of therapeutic emplotment. Its psychedelic properties create a suggestible mental state in which participants can be immersed in a powerful mythic narrative deeply rooted in their culture. Peyote is conceived in this narrative as a teacher, benign and omniscient, and the ceremony is rich in symbols and metaphors that allow the patient a chance to review their life story and to choose a new direction. With the peyote button presiding on the altar, the central fire reaches up to the sky where the moon traces the course of the night, a guiding light from above. It's succeeded by the dawn of a new day, the gift of life and a fresh beginning. The singing, drumming and prayers harness the shared experiences of the participants and connect them to the great spirit, God or nature. Peyote is both medicine and sacrament. It gives each participant its blessing, which in the case of those who are sick, includes insight into the cause of their condition and its cure. The ceremony is the beginning of a communal process that points the road to recovery, in which positive habits will be reinforced and unhealthy ones discouraged and health restored both to the sick individual and the group as a whole. In 1956, the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond while researching the effects of mescaline at Weyburn Mental Hospital in Saskatchewan, was invited to a local meeting of the Cree chapter of the Native American Church. That's uh, Humphrey Osmond there on the right. Osmond wrote that he found the ceremony extremely beautiful, and it inspired him to initiate trials of mescaline and LSD for the treatment of alcoholism. He recognised the Native Americans as masters of symbol, ceremony and ritual, and paid close attention to the settings of his own trials, priming the subjects with positive expectations, creating a relaxed, comfortable and non-clinical environment, introducing stimuli such as music and artworks. Using the new term he had coined in conversation with Aldous Huxley that year, Osmond christened his method psychedelic therapy. The Indians, Osmond wrote, have been very skillful in constructing their ceremonies so that it best meets their needs, but our needs are very different from theirs. As our two stories should make clear, indigenous therapeutics cannot be transposed wholesale into 21st century clinical practice. Western medicine has its own form of therapeutic emplotment, which enshrines quite different practices and assumptions. The doctor or therapist, the central figure in Western medicine, has no equivalent in the Native American church. The roadman who conducts the ceremony is not an expert high status professional, but a facilitator. facilitator. Their job is merely to ensure the ceremony is correctly conducted from which the healing proceeds organically. Unlike the confidential doctor-patient transaction, the roadman performs any individual healing rituals in full public view involving the other participants together with the sick individual. They, and not the roadman, will be the ones to accompany the patient on the next stages of their healing journey. In the clinical model, the patient is a passive recipient of the medicine which is administered as safely as possible and performs its function without any further ceremony. In the TP, the medicine creates the conditions for healing, but the patient's will and courage are central to the process. 
The all-night ceremony is a tough physical ordeal and recognized as such. Risks are not to be avoided or minimized, but confronted and defeated. These differences are implicit in the term medicine and its quite distinct meanings in Western and indigenous cultures. In the West, medicine usually refers to a drug, a chemical compound with bioactive properties. Modern notions of medicine are predicated on separating the physiological effects of the drug from extra pharmacological variables such as expectations, settings, beliefs and placebo responses. All such factors must be rigorously excluded before a medicine can be licensed. The indigenous definition is more expansive. Like the original term pharmacon in classical Greece, medicine in Native American traditions describes a range of tools or techniques, whether using a healing plant or a magically charged object, a learned technique or an individual's particular gift. Peyote is medicine in this broader sense. It is seen as crude and reductive to attribute its power simply to its biochemistry. Psychedelics may find new and valuable applications in the 21st century clinic, but eliciting their full healing potential may require us to rethink our ex and expand our notions of drug therapy and even of medicine itself. Thank you.